Vino Bus, we provide um, an investment service for fine wines and spirits. The way that we hedge against risk is to be able to offer diversification. My wife and I recently got married, but we got a barrel uh, for our anniversary date, right? And you know, eventually when it reaches 10, 12, 15 years, we're gonna bottle that and send it to our, uh, send it to our wedding guests. Historical returns, right? Looking at that, um, for the Scotch market, it's been around 12 to 15 percent a year. But um, you know, just just recently, you know, we made um, uh, an exit of about 150 barrels for our investors, and that was at an annualized return of about 30 percent. Hi, my name is Jason Raznick, the CEO of Benzinga, and welcome to the Raz Report. As always, before we kick things off, I want to quickly tell you about what Benzinga is. Before I started Benzinga in 2010, there were very few places to get real-time information on financial markets. I thought it was unfair that Wall Street had access to this information before the average Joe investor. So I created Benzinga to level the playing field for you, the retail investor. Benzinga is for the people and by the people. Now let's dive into the show. Very excited for this week's edition of the Raz Report. This is an exciting one. You ever want to get access to the same asset classes that the ultra the well ultra wealthy the elite get access to from art from different asset classes that they say you have to have a minimum net worth of millions of dollars to get access to this but this company this company that's i don't know probably a few years old vino vest gives you access to wine now whiskey i'm excited to introduce co-founder and ceo anthony jang to the raz report hey jason Welcome. it's great to be here how are you? When did you start uh, VitaVest? So we were founded in 2019. We launched uh, right in the beginning of COVID in March of 2020. Good and uh, we've been, we've been, yeah, I mean, it was honestly the best timing, right? Because wow. yeah. everyone was locked at home and drinking a lot more wine, getting a lot more active with their investments. So, um, you know, they say that success, right, is, is uh, mostly luck, a little bit of hard work in between. And we definitely hit that luck timing well. No, that's awesome, Anthony. I guess one question is, before you started VinaVest, what were you doing? Um, so I've, I've founded a few companies in the past. Uh, right before that, I was leading a cryptocurrency portfolio management company called Blockfolio. Um, we had knew we were just about to get acquired. So that was uh, the did jump. You get a, did, for, did you get acquired? Did you get acquired? Yes, we did. We got acquired for $150 million. Uh, by who? Co-founder and I, Brent, jump ship. So we got acquired by FTX. Okay. Did they, what's going on with the black Philly? Do they spin it off now in the bankruptcy? So we got a deal of, you know, tokens, cash and equity, right? The tokens were worth a lot now, not worth so much equity is, you know, who knows cash is cash. So no, but what I'm asking is, is black folio being sold off in the bankruptcy? No, so Blockfolio fully merged into FTX. It actually became the mobile app for the FTX uh, trading app. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, we had the president of the U.S. markets on the show here, and we had him at our event. You know, he built the F FTX brokerage app a while ago. And so, and then I was chair of the Voyager Credit Committee, the bankruptcy, which, meant, which means I had a decent amount of money at Voyager at one point. Good timing. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway. Let's go on to, um, we had you on before. I think it was about, on the Raz Report, about maybe a year and a half ago. What's, what's new in the last 18 months with VinoVest? So the main thing new has been our new product launch going into the spirits investment space and um, going into whiskey. So just to maybe backtrack a little bit, you know, VinoVest, we provide um, an investment service for fine wines and spirits. So what we do is we take wines that we believe will appreciate in value. Uh, we acquire them, we authenticate them, we store them, and then we give our customers an easy way to be able to access exposure into this asset class. And then at the end of the day, when the wine is matured, appreciated uh, in value, we'll then sell it off into the consumption market. So with our uh, whiskey product, we are doing the same thing except for whiskey barrels. So we're actually maturing these barrels, uh, both in America for, for bourbon, rye, single malt, as well as with scotch in Scotland and offering our clients an ability to be able to invest in these maturing barrels even before they're bottled. Okay. 
So I hear that, and the first thing I think about is trust. I don't think you can read it. I didn't have a black marker, but trust. So you said that these bottles of wine are so, are stored in vaults. How do like someone know that they're stored in vaults, or could someone break into the vaults? Like in crypto, these crypto and Bitcoin, I believe, fell because of the lack of trust in the market. How do you provide that trust to your users? Yeah, I totally agree that trust, especially with custody, right, is so important. And with with crypto and Bitcoin, it's it was very very hard to be able to instill trust, right? Because at the end of the day, it's all digital, right? The great thing about our asset class is that it's the farthest thing from it in terms of being able to prove trust. You can, you know, I I could walk you right to one of our warehouses and you could stare your barrel right in the eye, right? So we've done warehouse visits to our with our clients. Um, and we're, we offer that as a service for anybody who owns a cask or a case of wine with us. So, Anthony, CEO of VinoVest, how would you know which barrel that I own of whiskey? So every single person gets issued an ownership certificate. This is going to be able to be your unique identifier for your case or your barrel. That identifier is also being able to be a third party verified because we don't own any of these warehouses. These are warehouses that are operated by third parties. They're all bonded as well. And that means that uh, there are public records that also show the ownership of these casks and, and the IDs of these. Okay. Now I wanna, I know I talked, we talked about the wine market, what you guys been doing. You're, you mentioned you're entering the whiskey market. What led you guys to enter this category? I know spirits in general, but whiskey, I think is the main focus. What led you guys to get into this space? So in the beginning of last year, um, we had put up a wait list for our whiskey product because, you know, with a lot of our existing wine investors, uh, they've been asking us like, hey, like, you know, where are you guys ever going to do whiskey? And it was always something that I had planned to do, but I didn't really know when, right? We were still early on in the wine investment days. Uh, that wait list over the course of the last year went from zero to over 15,000 people. So we got to give the people what wow. they want. We raised a strategic round of funding earlier last year uh, into our whiskey, you know, into launching our whiskey product and accelerating that in our product timelines. And we're able to launch that fully in March, March, March of last year. So you had a wait list of 15,000, you launched it. Does that 15,000 then buy assets in whiskey or like how many people do you have actively like buying or are they trading? Like how is it working, I guess? Yeah, so like like wine, whiskey is a long term hold because the the appreciation really depends on how old the liquid in the barrel is, right? So you buy a brand new barrel, you're really expected to hold it for at least three to five years when, when it gets to a three to five year old bourbon, for example, and then a big brand like you know High West or a Whistle Pig will come to us, buy that aged liquid, and then turn it into their branded product. So. How do you guys know how to buy whiskey right? So we look at the mash bills, right? So that's essentially the mix and, you know, sort of the recipe for what that whiskey will become. And we're able to look at trends on what the big brands are selling, right? So if we know that, say, um, you know, a high rye bourbon is really, really popular and that there's demand for it, you know, the brands will come to us and be like, hey, we're looking for this, right? We just need it to be aged X amount of years for um for them to be able to actually bottle it and and sell it to their consumers so we look at that and we also diversify across different mash bills in case trends change but like do you did you hire a whiskey expert uh we have we have a really knowledgeable team of folks who have worked in the whiskey industry have owned brands before and are on our sales and procurement team yes so are you guys one of the only ones that allow the average person to invest in whiskey like this? Yeah, we're, we're certainly one of the only ones. Um, you know, buying whiskey barrels, aging them and selling them uh, has been around you know, for, for many decades, right? But really to your point, right? It's been an ultra wealthy or, or you know, a, um, an institutional play, right? They're buying thousands of barrels um, and for uh, other folks, you know, who maybe only want one or two barrels, it just wasn't really economically feasible for them to be able to manage the entire process. And that's where we're changing the game, right? Because of the volume that we have, we're still buying thousands of barrels, 
but they're, you know, individual investors, people are buying three to five barrels a piece. And then we put it in order, which is for a couple thousand barrels to our suppliers. And they're still able to get the scale that they need, still only work with one, one party, VinoVest, and we're representing that on behalf of all of our clients. Do you have to be an accredited investor to invest in the whiskey barrels? You do not. So how much is like a barrel? So a barrel of American whiskey is $1,500 on average. Um, scotch, a little bit higher, right? That's usually the scotch barrels are closer to eight to 10 K. Okay. Um, so if I invest 10 K and I think I'm getting a bottle, a, a barrel of, of scotch. Okay. Mm-hmm. How do I know that I got a barrel of scotch versus you guys gave me a barrel of whiskey? So we'll, we'll give you the same thing that, that identifier, you'll be able to see the exact location of your barrel. Uh, you'll be able to see the age of it, the mash bill of it, and really follow its progress. Could, could I ever come into the warehouse and see it? Yeah. So for our high level really? clients, we even organized trips to Scotland, right? Really having a good time being able to taste out of your barrel too, right? And then being able to also see our facilities in our warehouse. And when did you say you got, when you launched the whiskey vertical? Uh, last year in March. Is the whiskey vertical coming into the size of the wine vertical, bigger, smaller, or a lot smaller? So it's certainly growing faster, right? So still the bulk of our business is, is on the wine side, but we're seeing more and more folks interested in the whiskey barrel uh, vertical, both from our existing user base as well as from new users. So we're really building up that brand, you know, helping our users and for potential folks realize that Vino Vest, right, we're not just wine only. We've expanded wine and spirits, and that's really a, a big push of what we'd like to do this year. Will you ever change the name of the company to be more no, broad? I like being the best. Yep, me too. Then the next question is, so you can do this on vinovest.com. Have you guys thought about or exploring partnerships with like some of our clients, the Schwab's, uh, Fidelity's, brokerages over the world? Yeah, so uh, right now we're really focused on democratization, right? Getting, getting the retail investor involved. Um, but I think eventually, right, we'll want to be able to move upstream and getting getting listed on a Schwab or you know a Fidelity is is a way to be able to have mass distribution, right? But uh, the structure of that product is going to have to change, right? It can't just be individual barrels being offered on the platform. It would have to be in a fund format, right, where people are buying shares of a larger pool of of whiskey barrels. Where you know here you have that direct ownership, and there's pros and cons to both. Okay, so um, around the again around the Raz report with Anthony Jang. Uh, CEO and co-founder of uh, VinoVest. Another question I have is, do you guys do any hedging to manage the risk with like tangible assets like wine and whis- risky? If, if they're, in, are they influenced by market fluctu- fluctuations at all? So wine and whiskey are remarkably stable because the bulk of the um, you know, price movements are really dependent on just the age of the liquid, right? Uh, if you look at say, uh, you know, Johnny Walker, right? Or look at McAllen, right? An 18-year-old Macallan is always going to cost more than a 15-year-old Macallan or a 12-year-old, right? There's just there's just very, very little possibility for a 12-year-old to ever cost more than an 18-year-old. And the price appreciation is really linear to the age, right? It's it's almost it's almost a, a you know a, a one you know a 1.0 correlation rate. It's about you know 0.89 or 0.92. So it's really steady, but the way that we hedge against risk is to be able to offer diversification, right? We don't want all of your exposure to be in one Scotch barrel or one American whiskey barrel, right? We want to give you different mash bills, different brands, and different countries, right? Because Scotch could fall out of favor, American whiskey could fall out of favor, right? But if you have exposure to both and different mash bills, then you're protected, right? Just like a traditional stock and bond portfolio. So... There's so many questions right now. <laughs> They're not even on my list. There's so many questions. Okay. Love I it. could buy a gift of Disney stock for my like a nephew that's born, right? Can I, I do that? I can I do that for this? I wanna if I wanna gift someone a whiskey barrel? Yeah. So we we offer that and actually, you know, for for myself, right? My wife and I recently got married uh, two years ago. Mazel tov. congratulations. Thank Come on, you. we need some wedding music, guys. It's good stuff. <laughs> 
Okay. So okay. we, uh, any we got kids a, yet? Not yet, but we got All a barrel, right. uh, for our anniversary date. Right. And, you know, okay. eventually when it reaches 10, 12, 15 years, we're going to bottle that and send it to our, uh, send it to our wedding guests. Oh, that's, that's awesome. It. That's so yeah. cool. That that's really that's cool. the equivalent of, you know, being able to get your Disney stock and turn it into a bunch of tickets. Well, yeah, right. What, so what, wait, what barrel did you get again? So we got a Highland Park. Uh, right now it's... Wait, is a Highland Park Scotch or whiskey? I'm an idiot. Yes, Scotch. Scotch. Yeah, Highland Park Scotch. Uh, you know, it's a couple of years old now. So we'll wait We'll wait a few more years and then we will be uh, bottling and enjoying it. So That's I, great. You're set, bottle your way when the time comes. You'll send it to your... Okay, now, um, what could... Like expected return. So if I... If I put ten thousand dollars into, so by the way, a thousand dollars. Can you does that for this for this the whiskey play? A thousand dollars won't be enough to even buy a barrel, right? So that I couldn't do a thousand, right? Yeah, it'd be around you know fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. So you year. can't buy pieces. You can't buy part of a barrel. You can't buy part of a barrel. So the entire barrel is about three hundred fifty bottles. Uh, we just introduced a lower minimum product called a whiskey lot, which is about fifty bottles. And you can get that for about three hundred dollars. Okay. All right. So now, if I put in ten thousand dollars, whatever I buy, whiskey, scotch, I don't know. What's like an expected return? Or do you guys have that? Are you allowed to say? Yeah. So it, historical returns, right? Looking at that um, for the scotch market, it's been around twelve to fifteen percent a year, and that's an average taken over the past fifteen years. American whiskey, we have less historical data on that, but um, you know just. Just recently, you know, we made um, uh, an exit of about 150 barrels for our investors, and that was at an annualized return of about 30 percent. Um, wait, hold on. I don't, wait, I don't wait, expect wait. all investments to be like that, but hold on, uh, hold I would on. Say, hold on. The Scotch market, you said the last 15 years, the historical return is what percentage? 12 to 15 percent. Okay, 12 to 15. You're saying you made an exit of 30 percent last year, but I thought you started this last year. Yeah, so we we had a seven month exit. So one of our, uh, you know, we had we had an inbound buyer for some of our American barrels. We sold 125 barrels um, at a annualized return of about 32. percent So if I would invested 100 thousand dollars, I wouldn't have got 130 thousand. I would have got like it was like six months. So maybe I would have got 115 thousand or something. Yeah, something. yeah. Okay. Now, um, and you said Scotch is historically for the last 15 years is 12 to 15 percent return. That's correct. So people, how do I get the return? I, do I, I don't get a check yearly, right? Like how do I get the return? Is it when you sell the barrel to someone else? Is that how that works? Exactly. Yeah. It's purely based on, you know, buying at a lower price, selling at a higher price, right? There's no dividends or income in between, right? You're just aging the barrel. And then when the barrel is matured, you sell it off to a buyer. Um, and then that's when you get your return. I mean, it's so freaking interesting. Like this, I mean, you're, you come from a technology background, entrepreneurship background, you get in this Vina vest, you're allowing people to access assets that they, you know, probably once weren't able to get access to. Do you have to be like an RAA? Are you guys like a certified something or a marketplace or? Yeah. So we have, we have alcohol licenses. We're regulated as an alcohol business because we're selling alcohol. Um, we, I've chosen not to securitize or sell fractions or shares of, of these, you know, for, for that reason, but also because we want to be able to allow our clients, you know, many of them who are wine and whiskey enthusiasts to eventually be able to have the benefit of you know, drinking their bottles, right. Or bottling it. Right. And you can't really do that. If you own a fraction of a barrel, you, you know, you can only just sell the share. So if you were going to fractionalize, then you would have to get licenses, I guess. Yeah, because then it becomes a security, right? You have to put that barrel into an LLC, right? Create shares of it. And then you don't actually own the barrel anymore, right? You own a share that represents an interest in an LLC that owns the barrel. So in essence, um, like, like for, to, to grow to grow VinoVest, you want more people to find out about you guys so they can invest in alternative assets, correct? Correct. And you don't need to have like a security license to do that because it's kind of like acting like an eBay or a StockX in the sense that it's like them buying and selling assets. It just happens to be this asset is alcohol. That's correct. Because, you know, right now, wine and whiskey are classified as collectibles, not as securities. 
Got it. Okay. All right. That's that's awesome. Um, as you have a company in alternative investment space, do you see the regulatory landscape evolving, and what impact might it have on platforms like like Vinovest? This is a question from Aaron Bree, one of our. Yeah, so I, you know, right now, I think there hasn't been any sort of major changes in the alternative investment space. Um, you know, not at least in the space that we're operating in. Right. There have been some changes in the crowdfunding rules. There have been some changes in the accredited investor definition rules. Right. Those are both, um, I think net positives for the alt asset space in general that bring more people into the space. Uh, but none of those directly, you know, op, uh, change the way that we operate as a business. Got it. Um, where, where, um, the, I guess you have this live marketplace function. How do you see this evolving? Is this something that you guys are going to do more on this live marketplace and, and what yeah, is that? So we, we have a VinoVest marketplace. Um, this is for both our clients as well as external counterparties like auction houses and wine retailers and merchants to be able to buy and sell um, their their assets so it provides additional liquidity uh, for users who may want to sell earlier or maybe their you know, circumstances are people active are, Anthony, are people actively using that so yeah so we have you know a few million dollars of volume going through that marketplace every single month um, you know, nowhere near the uh, the scale of a uh, a stock market, of course, right? It's there's no day trading going on in this marketplace, um, but we we do see this as a, a really beneficial product uh, in addition to our current sort of buy and hold asset management business uh, to be able to facilitate liquidity. We we just give me a real life example how that works. So if I and correct me when I'm wrong, if I would have invested in Vinovest two years ago, ten thousand dollars in bottles of wine. Would I be able to go to the live marketplace and sell it or how would that work? Yeah. So you could sell it. So say you have a case of wine that's $1,000, um, you want to sell it, you know, it, it's appreciated to 1100 and you're like, Hey, I want to take, how do I, how do I know if it's appreciated to 1100? Um, we have third party data feeds coming in that show you the prices of, of the wine. So say you want to take profit at 1200, right? So you can even set a limit order, set it at 1200 and whenever someone hits that, uh, you know, hits that offer, you get, you know, you get that transaction. So I recently bought tickets on Ticketmaster for the national championship, uh, Michigan, and I had one extra ticket. I put it on the marketplace. It didn't sell. Then Ticketmaster gave me an offer, said, here's instant money for this. So they bought it off me and then they resold it for more. Do you have like AI or anything like that, that if I have a thing, like you can say you guys will instantly buy it off the user and then you guys worry about reselling it? Um, so we don't do much of that at the moment, but it's definitely something that to facilitate liquidity, right? Especially for people who are in a pinch where, you know, maybe you're like, you know, maybe you're like eight hours to the game, right? You're like, I just need to get rid of this thing, right? Um, you know, we, we can definitely consider that in the future. Yeah, because yeah. you may find some no-brainer values. Um, also, uh, bottles of wine. Like, so if I have a bottle of wine at my house, I have from like four years ago, like say a Say it's worth two thousand on the market, and I'm in a pinch, and I want some liquidity. Do you guys buy people's random bottles of wine, or no? No, and I don't think we ever will, just because of the the trickiness with the condition of wine. Right, your wine could have been stored in an attic, could have been stored in a freezer. Right, and for us at Vinovest, we only buy from trusted parties, which is direct from wineries, and we only store in bonded warehouses. So we really take the condition and authenticity of our wine seriously okay and do you guys have like robo advisor like features like where you recommend hey you should invest in this one or yeah so all all of the asset management business like you know, it's is all based on our algorithms so if you came in with ten thousand dollars you'd put in some inputs onto our assessment and then our algorithm would actually be going out there and creating the portfolio for you so you don't need to be a wine investment expert. You don't need to be a wine enthusiast. You just need to know what your parameters are, right? Like, you know, what what else are you invested in, right? How much of your overall investable assets is this representing? And then what your expected timeline is, right? Are you a long-term investor? Are you five years? Are you 10 years? That really helps us be able to create the right portfolio of wines and whiskeys that'll be set to mature in five or 10 years so that they're ready you know, from a consumption standpoint to be exited. Yeah, I, okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, how many people work at Vinovest these days? So we are a team of 25 folks. 
are you remote only? Yeah, fully remote. Been been that way since before COVID too. So what's the makeup? Like what are the majority of people doing at the company? So we've got folks on the you know, actual procurement side on both wine and whiskey. You know, some live in Europe, given that most of the top wines in the world are coming out of Europe. Uh, we have a technology and data team, right? Doing all the things a tech company would do. And then we've got our you know, sales, marketing, customer service. So uh, really just a, a couple folks in each function. Now that I mean, you've been remote for a while, how do you like best communicate with your sales and marketing team? Are you guys like, do you have daily stand-ins? Do you have a weekly call? Like, how do you get the team together and communicate properly? Yeah, that's uh, one of the one of the biggest challenges of a remote company, especially across time zones, right? I think right. Uh, for us, it's it's number one is on transparency and documentation. We're really big on that at VinoVest, right? Public dashboards so that people can get access to the information that they need without having to ask somebody. Um, and then also for folks who can't join meetings, right? We have meeting notes. We, uh, for, for really big meetings, right? We, we record the entire uh, session so that people can play that back. And then we've got our you know, scheduled calls as well as you know, ad hoc. You can always just call someone up. Do you use tools like Asana or Notion or? Yeah, we're big on Notion for documentation and processes. Uh, we also run a, a lot of our uh, internal ticketing systems through there. We use Slack and Google Meets um, and what else you know, do we use a lot? And we have some internal tooling as well that we've built out. We don't use Notion. I wonder what we use for internal document process because like Asana doesn't really have that in there. I don't know why. Yeah, is uh, good for task management, right, and, and project management. And Notion has all those tools in it as well, but then it also has the documentation component, which is great. Yeah, but I don't know why Asana would not release a documentation component, right? Yeah, maybe they're working on it. I know, it's just been, <laughs> yeah. I guess I have the, that's another interview, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, VinoVest, you, I mean, you're, you're a founder of different companies. Like, do you want to be here for the long term, and or are you trying to sell to... Uh, I don't know, bigger player in the marketplace arena? Yeah, we're really just getting started. And, and personally, right, I've, I've always been interested in investing, you know, passionate about alternative assets. As you can tell by the wine bottles behind me, I, I also have a passion for wine. So uh, even if I was out of this job, I'd be spending my time thinking about wine or thinking about investing. So um, I'd, I'd love to be here for the long term, grow this into a, a big and meaningful business. I wonder if you ever could do offerings on Yield Street. I don't know if that would ever... Like, yeah, I don't know how that those folks. I've, I've been on the podcast there as well. Um, great people. Yeah. Um, all right. Now, these, these questions are not to do with VinoVest. It's more about you. How many unread text messages do you have now? Zero. I am very, very religious about getting to inbox zero, whether it be on my text inbox or my, or my Gmail. So at the end of every single day, I can sleep. Uh, I can sleep well. So when you're at tech zero, like say so, so some text that you see come in, you click on it, but you don't respond back to it. Like at that time, cause you need to like figure something out. Do you mark it back as unread or what do you do? I, I, I put on my own personal task management system to be like, you know, respond to okay. ABC. Yeah. So, so, uh, your personal task manager system, what do you use? Your notepad I use or? Oh, the Sunsama. What is it called? Sunsama, S-U-N-S-A-M-A. S U N S A M A. What is that? Yeah. Full disclosure. I'm an angel investor in the company, but it's a really amazing personal task planning uh, app. It integrates with your calendar, your schedule, um, and, um, also can be used with team features, but I use this just for myself. I use Evernote as a note listing thing. And, but one thing I found really interesting that you just said is when you have a text message, Say, say it's for me and say I'm asking you like two questions. I have an investor who wants to put in 200,000 in buying a portfolio and you, you want to be inbox zero. You have to, you respond to me like, Hey Jay, I'll, I'll look up the info for you. I'll get the, I'll get back to you next week. What you do is you don't keep me as unread. You put it in your task management list. Yeah. So, all right. right. Yeah. And I'll know like based on the urgency the next day, it'll be all right. You know, how can I batch small tasks together? How can I do the chunkier ones in, in different times of the day? And then, you know, it, it, it works for me. So you batch the small tasks together and then you, 
Okay. And Sunsama, S-U-N-S-A-M-A, helps you with that. Yep. This is going to be a separate clip. I'm glad I asked this question. All yeah. right. What, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh. I can change it. If you want. That's a good one. I mean, I think good what advice. Advi- what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs? I'd say just believe in, your, believe in yourself. Never give up. I think, you know, as an entrepreneur, right, you and I know, right, there's 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 more downs than highs, right? And then you just have to believe in yourself, take your lumps and just know that, you know, those down feelings when you just want to give up or things aren't working, right? Like that's, those are things that every single great entrepreneur has to go through to get to where they are. Okay. Agreed. Uh, when do you, when do you, what do you do when you feel stressed or discouraged? Oh, give my dog a big hug. I think uh, I'm a big believer in the power of animals. They just kind of know things, right? And what kind of dog? Uh, I have a 50 pound sheep doodle named Duke. Okay, love it. So that's what you do. You, you give the dog a big hug. Yeah, he loves okay. it. <laughs> what was you for sure? What was your most difficult challenge in life? Most difficult challenge is, I mean, undoubtedly, it's been my, my spinal cord injury. Right? Um, you know, for those who don't know my personal story, I had a, a suffered a spinal cord injury, became a quadriplegic eight years ago now. Um, you know, still I'm in a wheelchair, still, you know, greatly limited mobility wise. But, um, you know, that happened when I was 21 years old. It's right? still a kid and not still figuring things out. And uh, I'm still figuring th- things out and learning more about my injury every day. But, um, you know, living, uh, you know, living with a disability like this that impacts so many parts of your life more than just being able to stand up and walk um, is, is a huge challenge every day. Yeah. I uh, you know people are listening and they're like, what was your spinal cord injury? Yeah. So I, I, I dove into a pool um, instantly, broke my neck at the bottom. I shattered my C5 vertebrae, which is pretty high up on your neck. So everything, everything below uh, my neck is impaired. And, and you live to tell about it. I know two people that dove into, or, you know, into a lake and, well, one is apparently one didn't live one. Yeah. Same, same thing. I mean, yeah. there's all these nerve cell things and regenerative nerve cells, the spinal cord thing that they're working on, you know, like that they're working on. Hopefully that some of that technology helps regenerate nerve cells. Cause that's, you got to re enlighten the nerves, right? Is that like how yeah. it sort of is? Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, the spinal cord is really one of the only things in the body that does not really grow back again. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the spine and the brain are still uh, very much so mysteries to, to people working on them. And, you know, the, to your point, there are pretty exciting uh, initiatives being worked on, right? Like Elon Musk, Neuralink, that's a big one. Yep. Uh, there's also been a lot of spinal cord uh, bridges, as you say, where they in, implant stimulators between the broken parts of your spine to try to bypass the, the broken spinal cord. So uh, there is research uh being done in that you know that's yeah the, the there's no follow yeah i just know dan gilbert like you know owner of the calves and rocket mortgage is you know a small investor in here you know he had a stroke and and you know looking at like how stroke recovery works and spinal cord and like the, the nerve cells but no i mean that'll be your next startup solving you know figuring out how to monitor or even be alerted so the researchers all find out the same stuff this i feel like there's so much communications are probably going to be improved that would help discovery of the next thing and cure you know but, yeah and unfortunately there's a lot of animosity between different research camps and groups where if they really just all work together i think we would uh we'd be in a much better place in the world but uh just from my personal experience where you know i've been deeply interested in my own recovery and uh, the different camps of scientists that I've spoken to, like they, they don't really love each other um, or, or even yeah, like yeah. Each other. that's very frustrating, especially, you know, yeah. and you're, you're, I mean, you're a shining example of how you can be so successful and have injuries and live a life and build businesses. Um, do you get out there and speak like on like any circuits and talk about how you've, not only survive but thrived um no but it's something that i would love to do right i think that 
Um, having, you know, having, you know, role models is important. There's a ton of people living with different types of disabilities, you know, that, you know, I think are, are definitely down on themselves or don't think that they can achieve as much as they, they could have prior to their injury, or maybe they were born with a disability. Right. So I think it's important to have representation. That's awesome, Anthony. All right. Um, outside of business or sports, what is something you want to accomplish? Um, I'd love to own a vineyard someday. I, um, every single time I go wine tasting, I'm like, damn, this is the life. You know, it's uh, probably my, my drunken thoughts there because I know economically owning a vineyard is a sure way to lose money. But one day I would like to do that. Yeah. Um, by the way, you know, one way to get new users to VinaVest, do you guys, I know it's an investment, but do you give gift cards out? Uh, we have not done gift I'm cards. Just, I'm just thinking about... So I was about to tell you about my friend who's like the biggest wine expert I know in the world. Like he's a chef. He's run the biggest restaurants in New York and everywhere. And he's the biggest wine person I know. But what I was thinking about is the reason I thought about him is because of this charity event. At charity events, give $150 gift cards to VinoVest at charity events, like in their silent auction or whatever. I don't know because the people who are at the charity event bidding, they have money. They don't know about VinoVest, let's arguably say. This is their introduction to VinaVest. I feel like you could get your AUM up a decent amount if you start looking at charity events around the country and figure out what you could offer them to get those people with high net worth, VinaVest, the marketplace to buy and sell your wine or something like that. Like that, is that a slow, I don't know if that's a slogan that you guys use, but is that, uh, I don't know, buy and sell wine, is that a slogan or no? No, no, we don't, we don't have a slogan, honestly. Huh. Well, but, that, but, you, but you can do that with you guys a little bit, right? Yeah. So yeah, we got to thought about gift cards, especially whenever it's around the holiday season, but we've always been just so busy with closing out the year that we're. <laughs> yeah. You got to get involved with charity events. You got to get involved with charity events. That's where your high net worth individuals are right there buying stuff and just put a thing in there. 25,000 a year on charity events. Somehow you're given, you'll get so much high net worth people to know about you guys. I, I think with very little marketing, I'll yeah. reach out to you on that. Cause I, I go to charity events. Not a okay. lot, but I go to some, and I've yeah, I, I think that would be a good thing. All right, last question is: What was your worst or or first job? Okay, first job was um, actually um, working for myself. I I honestly never had a, a serious job outside of being an entrepreneur, and uh, I love it. That's I, that's the reason. That why was I, your first. What was the first? What was the first one? First business, I was 18 years old, freshman in college, and started a food delivery business called Envoy Now. And yep. that's the business that really, uh, you know. Were, were you delivering on bike or what were you doing? Uh, I, I was delivering on anything that moved. Remember yep. those uh, sort of Segway things that were really popular that yep. all the kids were using? Like, we even had a fleet of those at one of our campuses. Oh, my God. That's cool. It's my dream of being a Segway. I saw it at the airport recently. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. What happened to it? So we, we got acquired by a company that eventually became a part of Walmart. So we grew that, Look scaled it out to about 23 markets over the course of Look four years. Look at you, Anthony, when you're 18. See, I had a startup then. I had it going pretty well. And then I just like kind of like Borders was going to buy it. And I'm like, ah, I just got when I got to the like finish line, when I got excited by it, then I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to the next thing. And then I got into online dating in 2001. I should have stuck with that, too. That would have okay. been a good one. But it was early. All right. Anthony Jang. Founder, co-founder of you know, Vest, um, and this whiskey marketplace that if you haven't checked out, you have to check out. I'm going to buy some whiskey in there. Aaron Bree's leaving now, so he must be happy with my interview. He helped me get ready. Check it out, you know, Vest. Check out Anthony Jing's story. It's awesome. Great team. Great site. And, uh, you know, look, if, you, if anyone has any questions, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, you can email me. So I'm at Anthony at VinoVest.co. Uh, you know, Perfect. As I mentioned, I get to inbox zero, so you'll definitely hear from me. Oh, my God. Do you use Gmail or do you use uh, yeah, Matt? Gmail. Do you do important unread and important in the other thing or no? Uh, I use a, uh, it was a tool called Mailman, which helps me batch um, my messages and helps me delete the spam, automatically filter those out. Um, and that helps me a lot with my email productivity. So that Mailman. Way, is it yeah. Mailman, another another productivity app that I love. I think I know it. it was one guy that got funded by the guys from Vancouver, maybe? I have to check it. 
I'll check it. I'll I'm check it out. History, but I've I've been using them since pretty much they launched. How many years ago you think? Uh, at least three now. All right, I'm gonna check it out. I thought so. Yeah. It's not Mailman's not the one where you delay an email, is it? It does. It does delay and batch emails. Yeah. I think that. Okay. It, okay. So you actually. Okay. I, maybe I'll try it again. I think I had it before. Yeah, because okay. that way I have different times of the day where I just block out for emails rather than they just you know when they just come in. You, it's really easy for you to just want to take care of them right away, right? Just look at it. So that way I can know I'm distraction free for a couple hours. I can get other shit done. And then I de- dedicate you know, certain blocks of my day to email. Love it. You're, you're the mat. That's your other thing you got to start, Anthony. Time management. You're, I'm about to create a time management course starring Anthony Zang, Anthony Jang. So you ready couple, for that one? A couple tools that I've learned along the way, but I'm still. Any, any other last minute tools you want to tell us? You did good so far. So I think being busy forces you to be good at time management. Got it. Yep. Got it. All right, Anthony, thank you so much. Appreciate your time and uh, go check out VinoVest. Thank you so much, Jason. It's, it's a pleasure.